Is Vladimir Putin justified in invading Ukraine? A number of people in the West point out that the mainstream media and the government agencies that are all now condemning Putin's war in Ukraine are the same ones that they feel at least showed themselves ready to spread falsehoods when it suited them. So they are inclined to challenge the notion that the war in Ukraine is all down to Putin and that it has no legal or moral justification. Well, on this channel, I try to look at the merits of arguments, divorced from all the background, the opinions about the people who are making them. So let's look at this one with an open mind. What are the arguments being made in justification of Putin's actions in Ukraine, the legal arguments in terms of international law, the moral arguments that some people are finding compelling in the West? How well do they hold up? Let's have a look. So let's start with the strictly legal arguments by Russia before going on to some of the more colourful ones. And that starts with a contention of self-defence. Let's just remember the beginning. On the 22nd of February, Putin had announced Russia's recognition of independent republics of Luhansk and Donetsk in the Donbass region. Two days later, on the 24th, Russian troops invaded, and on the same day, Russia's permanent representative to the United Nations notified it that its attack was taken in accordance with Article 51 of the United Nations Charter in the exercise of the right of self-defence. That sounds a little extraordinary because Ukraine was not attacking Russia in any way. To support the claim, he pointed to a speech that Putin had made the previous day. In that speech, Putin pointed to the expansion of NATO over the time since the collapse of the Soviet Union, of when they, in his view, used aggressive force against others illegitimately, starting with Belgrade, then Iraq, Libya and Syria, and particularly with the focus on Iraq, the fact that the claimed justification, weapons of mass destruction, turned out to be demonstrably false. He then went on to say that these forces carried out a coup in Ukraine in 2014. The forces that carried out this coup were committing genocide in the Donbass against the people there, people who relied on Russia for protection. He said that while Russia respected the sovereignty of the newly formed post-Soviet countries, quote, Russia cannot feel safe, develop, exist with a constant threat emanating from the territory of modern Ukraine. Circumstances require us to take decisive and immediate action. The People's Republics of Donbass turned to Russia with a request for help. In this regard, in accordance with Article 51 of the UN Charter, I decided to conduct a special military operation. Ah, that phrase we've come to know so well. Its goal is to protect people who have been subjected to bullying and genocide by the Kiev regime for eight years. And for this, we will strive for the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. It's worth also noting that throughout the recent period, Putin has repeatedly claimed that Ukraine and Russia are one people with a shared destiny. He went so far as to argue that no separate Ukrainian nation existed before its creation by the Soviet Union. So bear in mind what the test is here, if you're talking about a legal justification. It's not that Ukraine has done some things you don't like, because nations complain about each other's actions all the time, whilst recognising that such disputes don't violate each other's right to territorial integrity. So, what does Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, to which Putin refers, actually say? It says this, Nothing in the present Charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defence if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations, until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. Measures taken by members in exercise of this right of self-defence shall be immediately reported to the Security Council and shall not in any way affect the authority and responsibility of the Security Council under the present Charter to take at any time such action as it deems necessary in order to maintain or restore international peace and security. So Russia's notification of the UN on the day of the invasion was its act to comply with the terms of the article. The question is whether the criteria had been met, even if you accepted their version of events, which you might suggest is a pretty big if. 
First, the requirement for that legal defence of self-defence is an armed attack. There is no suggestion that the state of Ukraine was carrying out any kind of armed attack against Russia. Nor is there the slightest evidence that it was preparing for any such attack imminently. The essence of Putin's case, though, goes beyond Ukraine to see NATO and the United States as the key instigators. And that's consistent with what I've discussed here before. Putin's perception that Ukraine was pulled away from the correct pro-Russian path by a coup that was actively encouraged or even conducted by NATO. He argues that NATO has behaved contrary to international law in past conflicts and asks what next are we to expect. And he said this... With NATO's eastward expansion, the situation for Russia has been becoming worse and more dangerous by the year. Moreover, these past days, NATO leadership has been blunt in its statements that they need to accelerate and step up efforts to bring the alliance's infrastructure closer to Russia's borders. We cannot stay idle and passively observe these developments. This would be an absolutely impossible thing for us to do. The problem is that in territories adjacent to Russia, which I have to note is our historical land, a hostile anti-Russia is taking shape. Fully controlled from the outside, it is doing everything to attract NATO armed forces and obtain cutting-edge weapons. They will undoubtedly try to bring war to Crimea, just as they have done in Donbass, to kill innocent people just as members of the punitive units of Ukrainian nationalist and Hitler's accomplices did during the Great Patriotic War. He went on to say that the independent republics in the Donbass, which of course are not recognised as such by Ukraine nor the United Nations, but was recognised as such by Russia just two days earlier, they were under attack, a genocide of millions of people, and they had asked Russia for help. Let's deal with the legal issues that run through all that as I understand them. Article 51 describes an act of self-defence in response to an actual attack. What Putin's describing is anticipatory self-defence. Ironically, Ukraine would have had that. If Ukraine had attacked Russia as its troops began to build up on the border but before it had invaded, it could have used that argument with significantly more evidence. The 2002 Security Council strategy showed that for centuries international law had recognised that a nation was justified in taking action on the visible existence of an imminent threat. Most often a visible mobilisation of armies, navies and air forces preparing to attack. But in international law, anticipatory self-defence has long been a disputed and difficult principle for obvious reasons. We don't have to explore that. We only have to note that because of those difficulties, Article 51 is explicit that an attack should be underway to justify the right of self-defence with reference to Article 51. You might want to make a moral case for your actions. There might be circumstances where such a case would be considered highly persuasive, but you couldn't cite Article 51 as a legal defence. In any case, the absence of any evidence beyond your leader's reading of history and the belief that it leads to inevitable conflict of the intent to attack the defence of Article 51 isn't remotely relevant. So what about Putin's assertions that the independent regions of Luhansk and Donetsk had requested military assistance? making Russia's intervention an act of collective defence with two republics with which Russia had just signed military assistance treaties. This relies on a precedent from the International Court of Justice in the Paramilitary Activities Judgment. The problem is that the right to request military support is limited to nation-states. The International Court made this explicit in paragraph 246 of its ruling. The principle of non-intervention derives from customary international law. It would certainly lose its effectiveness as a principle of law if intervention were to be justified by a mere request for assistance made by an opposition group in another state. Russia may decide to unilaterally recognise parts of Ukraine as independent, but that action alone doesn't make it so. Not as far as Ukraine is concerned, obviously. Not as far as the United Nations is concerned, either. Of course, sometimes new states do come into being due to an internal successionist revolution or whatever it may be. 
But the definition within the UN Charter is that the criteria for statehood requires a test of independence. When an entity is entirely dependent upon its foreign sponsor, very much the case here, that can't apply. And there are certain grey areas there for sure, but the situation in the Donbass is a long way from the principle of self-determination in Article 1 of the UN Charter. Russia's actions over the last couple of months would also fail to meet universally accepted elements of self-defence as outlined in numerous judgments of the International Court, those of necessity and proportionality. There is no evidence that forcible action needed to be taken imminently to defend the state. And the scale and scope of Russia's action has in any case gone far, far beyond that theoretically required to defend the so-called independent republics, even if the threat to them alleged had been real. And we're only entertaining that it was in order to review whether the legal case would be solid were you to believe it to be so. The answer is, it isn't. So whatever other arguments people might have, they are not supported by international law. But maybe there are some morally persuasive ones nonetheless, so let's turn to what they are. And they tend to fall along the lines to suggest things like, one, Ukraine is indeed, as Russia claims, full of Nazis, not selfless heroes, as people would like to think. Two, the mainstream media lied about Russia before in relation to Russia influencing Trump's 2016 election, for instance, and there are times when they've lied about other political issues when it suited them, so they must be lying about this. And that leads them to support Russia's contentions that, for instance, the killing of civilians at Bucha were all carried out by Ukraine, not by Russia. And then there's the Putin talking point that Ukraine is not even a real country, that if you look at its history, it's always been part of Russia, and that is justification. This isn't a foreign adventure, this is an internal affair. Also, they say the West has done bad things in the past, most egregiously it invaded Iraq in order to bring about regime change, so if they could do that, why is this so different? We'll talk about those and whether they have merit in a moment. It's worth reiterating right now, though, none of them constitutes a legal argument. So, for instance, that first argument that there are some unpleasant people in Ukraine, not all these spotless heroes that people are now projecting onto them, that is, of course, true of pretty much every single country in the world. Of course, some of the people fighting for their country against an invasion right now are deeply unpleasant people. Some of them also, of course, are heroes, and most of them are ordinary people trying to get through. Some of the civilians getting bombed before the war were possibly totally insufferable, bigoted, vain people, just like every community has got some of those people. The fact that people in the West are idealising the Ukrainians right now because of the immense courage that many have been showing in the fight against Russia, that is natural enough. It's a side effect of what happens when people pick a side. Of course, you can choose to hit back against that by finding examples of the worst Ukrainian behaviour and pointing to it. And even if every time that was done, it was entirely valid, which often it's not because there's quite a lot of fakery around, but even if it was, none of it would justify or produce moral equivalence when an army has invaded and is attacking civilians. The fact that Ukraine has had problems with its own brand of Nazi similar strongmen is well documented, as is their disaffection with the Ukrainian government and the fact that they're not representative of the population as a whole. So the Azov Regiment started as a volunteer battalion whose courage and skill in battle made them invaluable to the regime back in 2014 in the fight against Russian supporting separatists. Simply put, they were deeply unpleasant in terms of their political ideas, but at that point they were ten times better on the battlefield than the relatively poorly led Ukrainian forces were. They were also, though, very anti the then government in Kiev, and the article carried interviews with individuals who were dreaming of a strong dictator who would crush the weak Ukrainian leadership and create a stronger Ukraine. Once the conflict had subsided, 
The government tried to deal with this group by acknowledging their heroism and service, of course, and then absorbing them into the ranks of the official military where they could be diluted and subject to military discipline. That had some effect, but it didn't stop some of the ideas turning into a political movement. For example, in 2018, there was a demonstration in Kyiv by 600 members of the National Militia, a group that had emerged from Azov and certainly contained neo-Nazis amongst its ranks. But although such groups brought a rising amount of vigilantism and political violence, enough to constitute a real problem for the country, they remained a tiny minority. Far-right parties perform badly in parliamentary elections and outside agencies such as the US government and social media companies like Facebook banned any support for those groups. Now, of course, how you interpret the fact that Ukraine tried to defuse Azov by absorbing them is entirely up to your perspective. The Nation wrote in 2019, Ukraine is the world's only nation to have a neo-Nazi formation in its armed forces. You can argue that doesn't reflect the nuance of the situation, but it was also, strictly speaking, completely true. In the same year, 40 members of the US Congress called for Azov to be designated as a foreign terrorist organisation. And transnational far-right support for Azov has been wide, with men from across three continents documented as having joined their independent training units looking for combat experience amongst their fellow travellers. For instance, this investigation by the open source organisation Bellingcat showed Azov's outreach to American neo-Nazi groups. Now, does Putin really care about any of that? Of course not. His argument now is that Nazism is running the Ukrainian state, which is absurd. Russia routinely labels its enemies as Nazis because of the huge emotional connection from World War II, where Soviet Russia lost more men than any other nation by far. And he has been willing to, cautiously for sure, as I described in my previous video profile on him, to play to the extreme nationalist wing in his own country when he felt like the occasion needed it. But none of that stops Western contrarians, those whose brand is defined by being in opposition to whatever the mainstream consensus is at any point, in pointing to the instances of all of this inaction and using it to at least puncture the tendency that people have to idealise those that they're supporting whilst demonising the other side. Now, some of them do that without tipping over into actually supporting Putin's actions and their supposed justifications. Others take the whole thing hook, line and sinker. I don't propose to spend a lot of time here dealing with the out-and-out -out fantasists, those who spread Russian absurd misinformation claims, such as that Ukrainians were behind the massacres at Bucha. Claim after claim like that gets made, easily knocked down because this was an event happening in full sight, and when they get knocked down they just shrug their shoulders and go on to the next claim, as though nothing had been said. So we had the Russians saying that, oh, all these dead bodies were crisis actors and you saw them moving. And if they were real, then they were killed after Russian had left. Because Russian disinformation tactics, as we discussed in the shooting down of flight MH17, don't even try to be internally consistent. It's about seeding doubt and cynicism. But the videos were analysed and it was shown no, none of the long dead people were moving and we had access to detailed satellite imagery that showed very clearly that the bodies had been there some time before the Russians had left and so on it went. And it just really boggles the mind why Ukrainians would decide to massacre Ukrainian civilians and why they would wait until the Russian soldiers had come into the area to do so. If you can swallow that kind of explanation whole, you might take that as a flag that you need to do some work to reconnect your sense of perspective to something that looks a little bit like reality. We have seen many, many invasions in history, and an unfortunately high percentage of them have seen routine brutal behaviour by invaders. Rape, murder, torture, these are all things we have seen over and over again. We have never seen an invading army coming in, being confronted by citizens, destroying themselves or hiring large numbers of crisis actors whose performances are so perfect and so committed that they show up on satellite photos over the course of numerous days. So, of course, 
There are many testimonies from survivors as to what happened. They correlate with what CCTV images have shown, what on-the-ground video shots have shown, the bodies that have been left. If you look at one faked image online or one unidentified alleged witness saying the opposite, talking to a supposed independent journalist who just happens to be travelling with the Russian military, if you look at that little bit and you choose to believe that without once even doing the very simple search it would take to uncover the overwhelming weight of counter-evidence, that's a choice you're making. Such a process, though, has got nothing to do with the reality of what nations are allowed to do to each other. But what about Putin's historical point, that Ukraine is really a part of Russia? This is the sort of justification that has often been used through history to justify invasions. The truth is, of course, that if you trace the history of every country, you will find various invasions and counter-invasions, different peoples whose genetics, culture and language influence the land that they may be temporarily inhabited. Ukraine has a history where its people were never well-resourced enough militarily to fight off their powerful neighbours single-handedly, so they were constantly, in earlier times, making alliances with the one better to fight off the other. The Vikings were amongst the first. At various points it was Poland and an alliance around there, the Ottoman Empire, and yes, Russia. The only difference was that when the Ukrainian Cossack Hetmanate, at that point led by Bodan Komelnitsky, formed an alliance with the Russian Tsar, the Ukrainians believed they had joined an alliance of equals, as always before, with expectations of both sides. On the contrary, the Russian Tsar Alexei Romanov of Muscovy presumed they were now his subjects, and all of the duties conveniently flowed just one way. In a sense, you might say that Putin really is drawing from the spirit of that history, but it's not the exact history that he's arguing. I mean, how far back do you want to go? Kiev was a thriving centre before Russia existed, and while Moscow was just a field. I mean, could England now be invaded from Scandinavia by people reclaiming their Viking heritage? Should we swear fealty to President Macron because, you know, those Norman invasions? Ultimately, in the modern age, we have settled on the principle of the inviolability of existing national borders, say through a long process involving self-determination. What about the argument that Russia is surrounded by hostile NATO countries and that it has always wanted a buffer between it and its enemies? That's certainly how Russia has often seen its historical imperative and it is an understandable position. Yes, totally understandable from a historical perspective. Saying that the strategic concern is understandable, though, doesn't give carte blanche for an armed invasion. Not in the modern world as it currently exists. Now, the world as it used to exist, as Putin still argues that it does exist, is that major powers have heightened expectations and lesser powers simply have to accept their place in the pecking order. Now, This is so much related to why he could never accept any suggestion that after the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia had become a second-rate power. That totally rankled on him. And it's always been his intent that Russia should recover its former glory, at least some of it. And by that, he looked much more to the former Russian Empire of the Tsars rather than the old Soviet Union. In that view then yes, major powers will have a free hand to fight however they must to defend their interests. And those lesser powers, if they're caught in the crossfire, they just need to accept their subordinate role and make best do. That is not the world that we currently accept. In the modern world order, you would have to pursue those strategic interests through other means. You know, diplomacy, economic integration or economic pressure, whatever. Putin's actions that draw from the older power model were pretty much guaranteed to push those whose alliances he sought into the other camp. Because they looked at how Russia was governed and how it was behaving and they perceived, correctly as it turned out, that they needed to be defended against it. Now you can decide 
as some have, including apparently the Pope, which is very exciting, that NATO is more to blame for how geopolitics has unfolded. I think you need to get your head out of this question of who's to blame in order to focus on the real cause, which is that we have two different models of how the world order should be working. The rules-based world order that respects existing boundaries sees force as a defence of last resort for all the aberrations and imperfections of how that plays out in practice, and then the power-based world order, where major powers command respect and compliance from lesser powers. Both have had their time in the history of the world. There's even a moral justification people could make for either of them. It's just important to understand which one applies at any one time. What we're seeing now is a growing tension between whether the rise of China and the recent recovery of Russia constituted not just certain countries on the rise while others were in decline, but whether this is actually a solid transition to a different world morality framework. If you believe that power politics is morally right because it puts us in the grain of evolutionary logic or whatever, and therefore that's where we should go, then Russia's invasion is justified as the first opening of that transition. But it is wholly against the spirit of the existing system, almost by design. It's a feature, not a bug. So if you want to live in the rules-based world, where there's at least some semblance of process and free speech and all of that, then nothing much lines up in favour of this action that I can see. I do want to live in that world because it's the only world that enables me to make videos like this. I think I'm probably right in thinking you would prefer to live in that world as well, not wanting to speak for you. I mentioned before that I did a profile of Putin, how Putin sees the world. And we covered a lot of territory in that. If you come this far, you might want to watch that video next. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.